Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I'm Laura Carfing, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Breast Cancer Conversations. I am so excited and thrilled that you guys are here and joining us because we have a special guest today. We have Jamie from Natera who is joining us, and we're going to take a deep dive into the topics of Signatera, CT, or circulating tumor DNA, as well as some genetic testing and uncover what tools are available out there. Welcome to the conversation. So, Jamie, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us today. I feel like this conversation is long overdue. We've been emailing and talking a lot, and we are just so excited to be partnering with Natera and to shed light on Signatera specifically and the outstanding opportunities that patients have access to, um, kind of getting more informed information to make treatment decisions about their breast cancer diagnosis and treatment plans. So, without further ado, Jenny, can I turn things over to you if you'd like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to speak with you today. I am thrilled to be here. As Laura said, my name is Janie Fielder. I am a medical science liaison at Natera. I'm actually a nurse practitioner by background, practiced for many years. I've been at Natera about a year and a half now and manage a team of MSLs at Natera, specifically focusing on Signatera and also Empower, our hereditary cancer test. Fantastic. Thank you. And I was just, I think our paths crossed actually at a couple of different conferences, whether it was San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium or ASCO. And everywhere I went, there was, they were talking about Signatera and circulating tumor cells and this nascent trend about ways that we can get more information about our breast cancer, about the tumor and how that can help inform treatment decisions. Can you tell me a little bit about what Signatera is? Absolutely. So Signatera is a personalized test that can detect your tumor's DNA in your blood. So we know that every person's cancer is different and it is unique as their fingerprint. So every breast cancer is different. They may have, they may be the same type or subtype, but they're all different. And so that is what and how Signatera is designed with no two tests alike. So you can think of it as a signature of your tumor individualized to you. So to create the test, we take one-time analysis of both your blood and your tissue, and the tissue can be from your biopsy or your surgical specimen. And then we determine your unique set of mutations specific to your tumor. Your tumor mutations are then used to build a Signatera test or assay, we call it, And that assay is what is used each time we draw your blood serially to monitor for circulating tumor DNA. I love that. I love that this test is individualized, right? We talk a lot about personalized medicine. And so having something that is so individualized to the person. Can you explain a bit more about these tumor mutations? What are they? Are they similar to when I think about like HER2 positive or different tumor characteristics? So no, they're not similar to that. I'm sure everyone on the podcast knows how cancer develops in their body. Um, Mutations happen in cells over time. It can be related to our age. We know in breast cancer, our biggest risk factors are being a woman and getting older. Mutations just happen sometimes. They can be related to age, exposure to toxins, various reasons they can happen. So cells with mutations stop working like they're supposed to work. And sometimes they then can grow out of control and they can result in cancer. So Signatera is developed with those mutations from your tumor. So after the test is created, then we only need a simple blood draw each time to determine if those mutations or the circulating tumor DNA is present in your blood. And this can give you a picture of what your cancer is doing today. So circulating tumor DNA has a really short half-life. So when your blood is drawn, you know that at that specific point in time, what is going on? 
I like to think of it in terms of the three questions that patients frequently ask. I know I have had family members with cancer and they have asked these questions. Is my treatment working? What's going on? After they ring the bell from chemotherapy and they go home every day, they think, how will I know if my cancer is coming back? Yeah, absolutely. I resonate with that so much. I just hit my five-year mark, actually, and it's still something that is every day in my head. Some days more prevalent than others. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. And in the breast cancer community, too, I also hear people talking about Mm -hmm. evidence of disease or NED. So after this test is done, should someone get a routine Signatera test? Is this something that they would do annually or how frequently or when would they engage in this type of test? Sure. So it's a conversation you would have with your provider. And it certainly depends on where you are in your journey. So are you just starting out? Are you going to be receiving chemotherapy? Are you, have you had surgery? Have you finished chemotherapy? Are you on endocrine therapy? So it really, the timing really depends on where you are in your journey Are you just doing surveillance now to see how do I know if it's coming back? So that's a conversation to have with your provider and should be, once again, personalized to you and where you are in your journey. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit more about molecular residual disease. Is that related or similar or equivalent to like the CT DNA or are those two separate things? Please educate me on that piece. Absolutely. So The ctDNA or circulating tumor DNA is what happens when the tumor cells break apart and they release the DNA. So the contents that are inside, they release that into the blood and it circulates around. And as I said before, it has a really short time that it's alive and viable. So we know when we get your blood that that is a true reading of that point in time. So you'll hear the term MRD or molecular residual disease, and that's the presence of cancer cells in your body either during or after treatment. So they are so small that they can't be detected in imaging or the traditional ways that you look at them. So we're looking for really a needle in a haystack. We say that, but we can detect one cell within a 10 ml tomb of blood. So we really are looking for a needle in a haystack. My own personal diagnosis, I had surgery. I had um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So my my treatment involved chemotherapy first and then surgery. And so I remember actually, and that was good information to have because when they did the surgery, they I did not actually have a complete response to the chemotherapy. There was that moment of, okay, you have no evidence of disease. We can't physically see anything, but because we know that the chemotherapy didn't kill all the cancer cells in your tumor that we extracted, you might be eligible for additional chemotherapy. I actually was on another line of treatment afterwards just to make sure and make sure that if anything kind of spread or if there was any of this like shedding from the cancer cells that might be circulating around that we're trying to kill as much as possible. I think that's really helpful to know. Absolutely. We do have a study. I don't want to get into data complications, but we do have a study that looked at looking at whether you've had a complete response after your neoadjuvant treatment at the time of surgery and what was the difference in patients that were positive or negative for ctDNA. And actually with Signatera, it was much more indicative of their course rather than whether or not they achieved complete response at the time of surgery. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, it is. It's very fascinating. So anyway, we can detect the presence or absence and monitor if the return of your cancer and track the response to treatment. So just as we were talking about. Yeah. So that really leads to like why this test is so important. In just in general or in breast cancer? In breast cancer. Thank you. Yeah. As I mentioned, why it's important in breast cancer is the three questions that we frequently hear patients ask that I had talked about before. 
So Signatura can certainly add clarity to those questions, whether you're positive or negative, and then your provider will also get a value on the report. So you don't more than just is it positive or negative, but what is that value and and what is it over time? So we know that following your signature results over time is what's important to know if you stay negative or if it's increasing. And once again, it really depends on where you are in your cancer journey and what's going on. Yeah. Your treatment. So that goes back to what you were saying with that like serial testing, right? Every time you're getting your blood drawn, we have this time that we can be seeing any changes that would happen longitudinally. Absolutely. Awesome. And so how does this work in conjunction with scans or CT or other biomarker tests? Absolutely. So Signatera is another tool in the tool belt for your provider. So we never recommend that you use Signatera by itself, but that you use it in conjunction with the other um, the other tests, such as imaging or some Physicians in breast cancer do monitor with biomarkers. They're not as common. So you might hear 15-3 or 27-29. Those are two that some physicians will use in breast cancer. Yeah. And, you know, this is a silly question. I feel like I should know the answer to this. But does everyone have biomarkers? I feel like when I was diagnosed, and I'm HER2 positive, so that in and of itself might just be its own category. But everyone, and I don't know if it's also pertinent to those living with metastatic disease, but everyone is talking about biomarkers. Can you tell me a little bit more, like, is it always being tested for biomarkers or is it specific to a particular type of breast cancer? I would say it's more provider related. CA, as I mentioned before, stands for cancer antigen. So the tests look for a protein level in your blood. And so you want to know if it's elevated or it's at normal levels. The problems with biomarkers is that they have limitations and they can deliver false negative and false positive Mm -hmm. results. Not only that, sometimes they are not elevated until your cancer has already advanced. So I would say it's provider specific. I talk to a lot of providers that do not use biomarkers in breast cancer. That's really helpful to know. So I think I'm with a provider who doesn't, which is totally okay too, right? So it's better or worse or anything. It's just how they run their practice and the information that they're looking for. So that's really on my question. No worries. It was not a silly question. (laughs) Great. Okay, so as we're talking about these clues or these these indicators, whether it's for recurrence or the likelihood of recurrence, can you just clarify for me also, is Signatera searching for these circulating tumor cells to see if there's, an, at the molecular level, so not being picked up by scans, not visual, we don't know, we're still thinking we're no evidence of disease, but this will then be a sign for us to understand, oh, there might be some cancer cells out there and we can be proactive to, to address it? Yes. Yeah, so the providers that I speak to frequently that use Signatera in breast cancer will tell me that for patients that are positive, that they look at their patients a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. So we know according to the guidelines that there's really very little that they recommend as far as yearly and annual Follow up for breast cancer patients, an exam, imaging, mammography, and still have breasts for that. So, this is another way to look and see what's going on at a molecular level. And so, providers will say to me, I look at my patients differently. So, if they have a positive test, then I'll know I need to repeat that sooner. Or maybe I need to get imaging with that patient. So they really just look at their patients differently. Yeah, that's really helpful to hear and understand. And especially in our survivingbreastcancer.org community too. Unfortunately, I've dealt with a couple of friends who have recently had a recurrence. And so this has been really enlightening for us. We have our Thursday Night Thrivers support group. And 
Some of our women recently were waiting on test results or a second biopsy, and they're within that two to five year time frame mm-hmm. after their initial diagnosis. And it's, I think, important to realize that a recurrence doesn't always mean metastatic disease. It could mean a second tumor that could be related to the same characteristics of your first tumor, or it could be completely unrelated as well. And so I think it's this interesting space when we talk about recurrence that it doesn't necessarily equate to metastatic breast cancer. When I, I was stage 2B, and I'm like, oh, of course I'll be like stage 3 before I get to stage 4 and we'll find it. And so it doesn't always go in this linear path either. So I think when we talk about recurrence, it could take on many different forms. Absolutely. And there's local recurrence, which can be in the same breast. There's regional that can be in the lymph nodes. And then there's also metastatic. So we know that breast cancer tends to travel to four different places, the bones, the lung, the liver, and the brain. So that would be metastatic or advanced breast cancer. So yes, absolutely. Yes. So for Signatera then, would it be something that anyone could use regardless of their stage or is it geared more towards early stage or late stage people living with breast cancer? So really, Signatera is indicated for patients of any solid tumor type. So it's not just breast cancer. It can be colorectal cancer, any other solid cancers. In any subtype, it's more about monitoring high risk, high risk breast cancer patients. And I know you're going to ask me, then what do you mean by high risk? (laughs) (laughs) So I think that my best answer for that is recommending that patients talk to their provider. What do they consider high risk? So we know that a triple negative breast cancer is a high risk breast cancer. We know that larger tumors are high risk. We know that if you are first diagnosed and it's not early breast cancer, but it's more advanced, then you're high risk. So it's not intended for really low risk, early, early stage breast cancer, but for those high risk patients and your provider can talk to you about whether your breast cancer is high risk. Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Because we were talking about leveraging and utilizing Signatera in conjunction with CT or PET scan or other imaging. It's something that we could use all of us, right? When we're in that waiting period after surgery. Did you get it all? Do we have clear margins? Is there anything else I should be worried about? It's really nice to have these kind of tools in our toolbox to bring to our our providers, our physicians and medical professionals uh, and ask the questions for them. So it's also funny too, I have to chuckle a little bit because I remember being told I wasn't high risk when I was going in for an annual mammogram. I had a lumpectomy and I wasn't going in for a diagnostic. It was just like a routine. And they're like, oh, you're not high risk. We're just going to do the routine. And I'm like, but I had breast cancer. Does that not automatically make me a high risk patient? And I think being able to understand whether it's triple negative breast cancer, the size of the tumor, all of these other things that go into that category, I think are really helpful. And so if you can tell me a little bit more about the high risk realm, if we can dive into that a little bit more in hereditary cancers, I would say, does that fall also into the high risk category? Yes. Thinking about hereditary breast cancer, germline testing, as we call it, We know that most cancers are sporadic, which means they just randomly occur. As I said earlier, your biggest risk factors for breast cancer are being a woman and getting older. I now fall in both of those categories, unfortunately. Um, But we know that about 5 to 10% of breast cancers are hereditary. And what that means is that it's caused by a gene mutation that is passed down through the family. So... Hereditary cancer tests and genetic tests can identify those gene mutations that can be passed to other members of your family. So, for example, if you get breast cancer and you have a daughter, it's not only important for you, but it's important for your other family members. You can speak to your provider to understand if you qualify for germline testing, but 
the important thing that we know about it is that it dramatically increases your risk of breast cancer if you have these mutations. Interesting. I think we're all familiar with the BRCA or BRCA, BRCA1 and BRCA2, but there are a whole other line of genetic mutations as well that people could be tested for, such as PELB, CHECK2, ATM, TP53, for example. Well, so I think one of the reasons that we all know about BRCA is that the majority of hereditary breast cancer is related to BRCA. And we know that, as I said earlier, um, your chance of breast cancer as a woman in the U.S. is about 12 to 13%. However, if you have one of these mutations, it can go up to 60 to 80%. So dramatically increases your risk. Thus, with BRCA is about 60%. If you have CHECK2, it doubles your risk of breast cancer. ATM increases it two to four times percent. PALB2 cancers are most likely to be triple negative breast cancers. They're larger tumors. And they're also eligible for a certain um, treatment PARP inhibitors like a lap or rib. So if you know that you have those mutations, then sometimes there are treatments that are specific to also those mutations. So TP53, which is a tumor suppressor gene. So if that's if there's a mutation in that gene and it's not working, it can't suppress your tumor and it just really grows out of control. And so individuals with that mutation have a lifetime risk of breast cancer up to 80%. So dramatically increases your risk of breast cancer. So when you talk about high risk, this all kind of falls into that category. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And what's really interesting too about these hereditary genetic germline mutations, also I think it's worth noting because you were talking to if you like have a daughter or a son or like someone, um, your children, right? You might get yourself tested, but I think it's important for our listeners to note also that your children most likely will not be able to be tested until they're the age of 18 or older. I think when we just think about carrying on and you know, becoming an age of an adult where you can make these decisions yourself, there's a lot of things to consider for genetic testing, but that's a whole other episode. I'll link to that in the show notes as well about genetic testing, but something to think about too, because I know sometimes when you get diagnosed and you know that you're you carry the ATM gene, you might want to know if your five-year-old or 10-year-old have it also so you can be proactive. But unfortunately, they're too young to be tested. Yes, I would. I do want to mention that our EMPOWER test, which is our germline or hereditary cancer testing, we do have, if you test positive in your panel that your provider orders, testing is free for your first and second degree relatives. So the real advantage, speaking of how important it is for your other family members, because we know with some of these, such as BRCA and a couple of the other mutations we talked about, it not only increases your risk of breast cancer, but it also increases your lifetime risk for other female cancers. So really important to know what your risk is and then also any other family blood relatives that and their risk. It's one of those things where it like doesn't just affect you, it affects everyone around you. And it can also be a good topic of discussion at the dinner table. Tell me about Empower. So this is the specific test that people can get for their genetic panels. It is. We have several different panels. We even have a stat panel for BRCA1 and 2 because if they, if their your provider has a suspicion that you may have that mutation, then they want to know right away so that you can make surgical decisions and treatment decisions. So we do have a stat panel that you get the results really quick for those, and then the remainder of the panel is delivered in the same time frame. But I encourage you to talk to your provider about whether you qualify for hereditary or germline testing with your breast cancer. Yeah, super helpful. When I got diagnosed, it was funny. I 
I come from one of those families that we don't talk about our health care very much. Everyone's either sick or well. There's nothing in between. You're either doing well or you're not doing well, but we don't go into the details as to why. And it wasn't until I was diagnosed with breast cancer that my mom shared all of our family history on her side of the family. And then also my dad shared his too. I was kind of like this digging and almost like pulling teeth to figure out what all of the familiar history was from our health perspective. And I was eligible for genetic testing. I went and got, I think at the time, it was like a seven panel screening that was going to actually inform my surgery options. So I had a really great surgeon who said, you're eligible for a lumpectomy due to the location and size of my tumor. And that after genetic testing, if I did come back positive for BRCA1 to PAL check, all the ones that we were talking about, it would be in my best interest to have a full double mastectomy. And we were having that as part of the discussion. And so we went and did the genetic testing and my BRCA2 gene came back with a variance of unknown significance, which I just felt starting off my breast cancer journey, everything's already gray, nothing's black and white, everything's out there and we're waiting. But a variance of unknown significance actually means that it's being treated as if it were negative. And that is because the, and Janie, please correct me because I don't have all the correct terminology here. The lab that has all the genetic t- information doesn't have enough information to say one way or another if my gene was actually positive or negative. And so actually just recently, I found out that it came back. We finally have enough information five years later that my BRCA2 came back negative. This variance of unknown significance eventually became negative and I don't need to take further action. But it was one of those question marks and it was treated as if it were negative. So that's good to know. And I just want to share that with everyone listening because sometimes we go into these tests thinking it's either like a positive or a negative, but there's this opportunity sometimes for the unknowns. And we just follow the guidelines in terms of what the best options are at that time. I'm sure in your five-year journey, you have seen a lot of things change. And yes. particular right now um, with this organization, and it's great that we know so much now. I know my sister had breast cancer almost 30 years ago. And back then they didn't test for her too. That no one had heard of KI-67. So all of the testing and things that they do now, they didn't do then. And yeah. complete radical mastectomy and chemotherapy and everything that you could possibly give was what happened. And that's fortunately not what happens now. And we really want to enable women to know all of their options and understand all of their options and be active participants in driving their journey. Absolutely. And so this is just one other data point that people can take when making some of their treatment decisions and bring to their doctors and their surgeons and physicians about what's making the best choice for them as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to ask a little bit about genetics counseling, if you don't mind. Like I mentioned, this is when you're doing genetics, it's not just personal. You're now opening up the can of worms for other family members who may or may not be ready to know or have this information. Can you talk to me a little bit about what type of support services or genetic counseling the Tara offers? Absolutely. We have, I don't even know how many, a lot of genetic counselors at Natera. And the other part out of oncology is our our prenatal test, which is panorama. So we have a lot of genetic counselors associated with that also. So you certainly can speak with a genetic counselor about the results of your test. And we have um, several different ways that you can make that appointment. So absolutely, we have genetic counselors available. Super helpful. And so for someone listening right now, and they're interested in Sinatera or Empower, how can they get access to this information? Is there a website they can go to or someone they can contact? Sure. Uh, you can get on natera.com. We actually have a specific breast cancer page. I can provide you, Laura, with that. And you can post it. Yes. Uh, have an Instagram page, Natera Genetics. But the best way to get a signatory test is to talk to your provider 
They have to be ordered by a physician. So you need to speak with your provider. And if they're not familiar with the signatory test, then certainly have individuals that can meet with the provider to educate them on the process and what the results would mean for your cancer journey. Absolutely. That's great. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about cost because a breast cancer diagnosis is expensive. Is this something that would be covered by insurance or are there resources if someone needed to get this covered? Absolutely. So we actually have really exciting news, Laura, you and I haven't even talked about yet that last year, we last week, we received notification that Signatera has been approved for med, approved for Medicare coverage for stage 2B and above breast cancer. So all the way through advanced breast cancer. So we are really excited. We've been working towards this for quite a while. I'm in breast cancer. I'm this is really new news and I'm so That's excited. Awesome. To be That's such great news. news. <laughs> Here on the podcast we welcome all insurance plans. We work with patients so that cost is not a barrier to testing. We also offer at a very affordable self-pay rate for those who don't want to go the insurance route. And then we have a family assistance program. So lots of different options and a group of individuals that you can speak with on Atera in regards to the process. That's amazing. And such good news. I'm so excited to be the recipient of hearing this and debuting this to our listeners. That's fantastic, Janie. Thank you. I feel like we covered a lot in these 30 minutes of CTDNA, molecular residual disease. We talked about Empower, Signatera, ways that people who have been diagnosed with breast cancer can continue to be proactive in getting information and being a partner in those decision-making processes at these different points in time, whether it's for chemotherapy, surgery, maintenance and surveillance afterwards as well. So this has been incredibly helpful. Is there anything that we haven't discussed that we need to shed light on and share? I don't think so. I will give you the website link that you can post We also have a number you can call. And then, as I mentioned, there's a landing page specifically to breast cancer. So we'd be happy to provide you with those as follow-up to your listeners to be able to seek out additional information. And once again, as I said, we have um, sales teams and medical science liaison teams that would be happy to meet with your provider to talk about Signatera. Yeah, Yeah, that's fantastic. And We'll be linking out everything in the show notes. We have some blogs coming out as well. So people can visit on our website, survivingbreastcancer.org. And so really at the end of the day, we just want to provide the educational content for everyone so that they have the information to make the best informed decisions that's individualized and personalized for them. Thank you so much for having me today. It's truly been my honor to be here and to speak with you for your listeners. Oh, amazing. Me too. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you everyone for listening to our show. I would like to acknowledge that all of the information on our podcast are from personal experiences and are not a substitute for professional medical advice. You should always contact your medical care team. Our podcasts are made possible because of donations from listeners like you. So please feel free to make a contribution through survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash donate. And there are so many ways to get involved with our nonprofit and our organization, not just through listening to the podcast, but through all of our virtual programming. So you can check out all of our lineups by hopping over to survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash events. And as always, all of our programs, services, and resources are absolutely free. Thanks again and keep on thriving.